I'm from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and I'm one of the co-PIs on the Open Storage Network project. Um, as I think many of you can agree, science is collaborative and it's data-driven these days. And the simplest things can be the hardest things, especially if you are trying to share data with your collaborators outside of institutional firewalls, if you're trying to do anything at scale. Uh, there we go. Our, on our first webinar, we showed um, the science drivers, things that might make you need something like the open storage network. And on the next webinar, which will be in January, and I'll have a reminder at the end, um, that will be everything about the open storage network that you ever wanted to know. But today, and here we are, thank you for putting that red arrow up, Kevin. Here we are November 12th, if you can believe it almost at the end of 2020, thank goodness. <laughs> Today focuses on what, um, in a dissertation you might call the state of the art. We wanted to look across the globe, um, including some things happening with our, our partners here in the US, as well as some of our good colleagues in the EU. And uh, we wanted to focus in, there were many projects we could have chosen, but three in particular we thought uh, really had some interesting um, capabilities and uh, ways of coming at the same kind of problem that we wanted to focus in on. And so uh, just to remind you that um, we will have a concept paper coming out shortly. So in a little less than two weeks that we'll give a recap of the first webinar and what we um, had hoped to highlight from that, from those presentations. And then uh, just at the end of January, you'll see a concept paper come out that as the takeaways and a few things that we couldn't fit in on the webinar um, in a few pages. Uh, and then here's the date for um, the next webinar, which is January 21st. If you'd uh, like to register for any of these upcoming webinars, this is the link at the bottom here, openstoragenetwork.org forward slash seminar hyphen series. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm really excited to hear from our speakers. I'm really excited to see the speakers uh, since we can't be together in person. Uh, first up, I'd like to uh, hand over the screen sharing to my good colleague, Lenny Kroll Anderson. Um, and feel, feel free to, to get your slides up. And if you have any trouble, just let us know and we have a copy. Okay, we can see your slides. It's okay, they're not in presentation mode, but we can't hear you. I think you're still on mute. Sorry, yes, I was unmuted, uh, muted. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. And I will put this in presentation mode. Then I will start again saying thank you very much Christine for this very nice invitation. Uh, I think uh, even oh, and, though and pardon me Lenny it went into the uh, presenter view so if you want to just keep it in the other one that's fine where you're just showing most of the screen. Um, I know these these things are always tricky on zoom yes this is bigger this is better <laughs> that works for you. Better. Yes. <laughs> good good okay. All right, I will keep it there then. Yes, good, excellent, yeah. All right, well, I will start. Um, uh, I will start by giving you some insight about the, the European Open uh, Science Cloud. And uh, uh, I have called this presentation construction of the European Open Science Clouds via regional building blocks, because that's how it is being carried out in, uh, in Europe. Um, on this on this huge project that we are that, that we are into. First, I want to give you the background of uh, what's the whole idea and uh, and what I have uh, read so far about the your open storage network. I think we are uh, we are approaching uh, similar ambitions and challenges as well. So uh, 
this is the European uh, viewpoint. And uh, I, I believe we can share a lot of, of good knowledge and experience here. So I'm just gonna give you a, an honest and open uh, talk about where we are and uh, how we're going to, um, to, to, to meet some of these challenges that uh, Christine also was mentioning. The vision of EASC uh, and uh, um, the open storage network as you are having is, is, is the same, I guess, trusted virtual federated environment to store and share and reuse digital outputs from research including publication data, metadata, and software across our borders. Uh, and in Europe, it's, it's countries, uh, country borders, um, which make legislation also a big part of our challenge here. Uh, the EASC, the European Open Science Cloud Partnership timeframe is uh, where we are from now, is, is, is now the next step for us here in, in Europe, starting in, uh, 1st of January actually is to define the, the EOS core, we call it, to provide the core um, of the services, what is going to maintain at uh, being maintained at a central place and as a federated um, on a federated platform called EOS Portal. After that, that's stage two, which is scheduled for 2024 to 25 is to expand that core uh, of, of, um, of added value services. That's how it's, it's terminated yet. It's not defined at this point. And this is the, uh, it's a critical moment we are in right now because it, it's about, I will come to that later also, how, how these memberships is being established. But just to give you the time frame overview and, and from 26 to 27, um, the, the ambition is to have a deployment of a web of fair data and related services that, uh, that researchers can actually uh, start using. Um, um, actually, this summer, uh, the EOSC Association was, was established and the EOSC Association, the European Open Science Cloud legal entity is a legal entity and uh, it has been established with with initial four founding members, um, those that are listed here. And, and then there has been an open call for interested bodies or organization to, ex to express their interest of, of the memberships. And we have, at, up to today, we have around 200 organizations across Europe that would like to enter as a member. So even though we don't have rules of participation, we don't have our business model in place, uh, the countries and organization are really showing interest in uh, and seeing that this is the way forward. However, as you also are fully aware, I'm sure there is um, a lot of uh, politics behind how is it, how is the funding and how is the, the mandated services in, in its origin going to be shared across borders and across communities. Um, but this is a start and uh, very exciting times ahead of us for this. And also challenging, we, we do discuss um, how a general assembly now of 200 uh, bodies is going to be a decision-making body uh, in the long run. So this is also some, some of the points that are being discussed uh, fully. But the main duties of this new legal entity behind the European Open Science Cloud is to bring all of us as stakeholders together uh, in EU, collaborate with the EU and the member states across and, and uh, on activities that establish partnerships and, and developing a joint strategy for the open science, how to manage that in the European research area, and maintaining alignment between the operations sponsored by the legal entity and the e e uh, EU open science strategy. And then also to identify key infrastructure requirements for the capture, storage, processing, and sharing of data, and promote data, fair data, and enable key services and coordination and fostering technical environments and these facilitation of communication. Those key areas that we are working with when in, in order to, to be a reality in practice. So this is the this is the overview and background where we are right now in Europe and um, 
and I will then try to move into actually what is actually being done concretely in the in in the in the building blocks blocks of EOSC of the European Open Science Cloud. And um, this map here is um, shows that we are four regions in uh, in Europe, um, four uh, regional implementation project of Europe, the European Open Science Cloud. So we have been divided up into four regions and uh, making it work uh, on a regional basis before we centralize. So the saying is that if we, if we can make it to work in the Nordics, then it's not going to work at all in the European, uh, on a European level. <laughs> but, but let's see. Uh, so, but it's a good it's a good test bed. We are testing and demonstrating these cross-border services, opening up our data repositories and, and, and putting them into a context and testing them by real researchers uh, and getting their feedback uh, on how it's going to work or how it works in their field of use. This is the overview of, of, the, um, of the elements in EOS Nordic. If we start, we have the full picture. So it's a glimpse out of the whole European map. Um, we look at cross-border policies and legal alignment. We look at the fair data practices. We demonstrate it within uh, our research communities uh, from the services that can be used cross-borders today. And, uh, and then we try to pool it all in, uh, in, a, in a new context concept that we call the Knowledge Hub that has just recently been, la been launched. Uh, so why the Nordics? Why have we teamed up together? Um, it's a coordinated effort for sure. Uh, and we start at a regional level. We have in the Nordics, we have uh, a, a very strong and open, very strong open science programs. Um, and, and there are many actors already that are involved in the in the open science related initiatives. Um, and we have also, we have the Nordic Council of Ministers as a, as a regional body uh, that has already also um, ensured uh, a good history of research and policy collaboration. Um, and we have a so-called saying that the Nordic added value is that we can work together uh, and create uh, stronger results than on our own. EOSC Nordic is, a, is a, as I said, one of the four implementation projects in, uh, in Europe, and um, it's a budget of, of 6 million euro. euro. We are 24 partners uh, across 10 countries. Uh, the coordinator is uh, the, the director of the Nordic E-Infrastructure Corporation, uh, Gudmann Hust, and, uh, and I am the, the acting project manager of the project. We started last year in September, so we have now been running for a little bit more than one year uh, and celebrated our one year birthday uh, a month ago. <laughs> and uh, we, it's a three year uh, project period. Yes, so we are 10 countries working together in the Nordics and uh, I would say we hold around 200 participants now. We are the project is divided into six work packages. Uh, we have a management work package, and we have the one on policies. We have one on uh, focusing on the uh, service providers, uh, work packages four on fair data, and then we have all our use cases, and then we have a work package, package dedicated to communication and engagement. We have an uh, executive board. Uh, that is uh, representative of our general assembly. And we have in operational management, we have the project management board, and then we have um, an international advisory committee with, uh, with very strong profiles. And uh, I believe you, we are very privileged also to have uh, you, Christine, on this board together with uh, a, a strong profile of, of, of a variety of competences. For the policy area, we are what? What do we do? What do we do? What have we done in the first uh, first year? We are looking first of all. We need to start. Uh, we uh, we have different countries. We have different policies, different uh, regulations, and um, the first uh, year here has been to to 
map, the landscape of what is actually what kind of politics are present in the individual countries, the open science policies. Some countries doesn't even have uh, concrete policies yet. So we are mapping this out, sharing the information with each other uh, and our, our policy makers, making them aware where, where is hindrances or and actually the some of the first results that has come out has shown that it's actually not legal barriers that is uh, is blocking cross-border data flows it is simply in the within the communities and and understanding the workflows that uh, that should be in place and at the local in order for them to share their data um, we are investigating models and roles and responsibilities um, for the coordinated provisioning and delivery of EOS services and resources. So the, uh, the workflow of, uh, of a services, what is the, what kind of steps is there for a service from a, from a service provider to actually reach the, the researcher and the legal challenges, as I said, and in the ambition is simply when we bring things in front of us, we can also align and coordinate when we all when we all know what what we are uh, what the present situation is um service actual infrastructure service onboarding we call it uh, on the european open science cloud when we work in region we have established uh, it's we call them uh, pre-boarding platforms so in the nordic region we are we have a pre-boarding platform it means simply have identified the, the services that are in the nordic region that can be shared cross-border so just simply by visualizing uh, and illustrating that list of services is a huge step for us uh, it might seem simple but it is actually uh, not it's it's something that has been run in the countries uh, for, for the mandated use as always. So the, the sharing of that knowledge has not really been done before. And uh, so the actual implementation of getting those services to work cross-border uh, is, is something that we are working on in, in, this, in this context here. And, uh, and then we also, we, we, because we don't, we, we have, uh, we don't only have national service providers, we also have local service providers like universities. So, so those universities that have uh, tools and services that could be used in, uh, by different um, user communities than the initial intended, we, uh, we, we, have, we motivate them to also uh, share their uh, tools and uh, test them at national level. Um, testing them at national level and if it uh, if it is approved or if it can work at national level then we also uh, can convert them to or assist them into they or then they are compatible with the eos portal um, that, that's some of the setups that we have said here is just a picture of um, the the first round of our service discovery uh, analysis. So what kind of services do we have actually present in our countries? And um, if we have uh, definitely a lot of compute services, data storage, data analysis tools, data access, uh, security identity, and so on. And it's, um, yes, it gives a picture of how services are distributed and, uh, and also to some extent, the need uh, that we see. Yeah. Um, developing fair data practices across the Nordic and Baltics. Uh, here we investigate the existing practices. We develop incentives, uh, not alone, uh, jointly with RDA and, uh, and other uh, related organizations in the, in the field. And um, we, try to enable mainstreaming of standards and data management um, and, and certification schemas. We have, uh, in the first year of EOSC Nordic, we have developed um, a so-called fair maturity model uh, in, on an automated basis. Um, and it's already being developed uh, 
uh, for its next version I can share with you. But but this gives an estimate on um, on the repositories. We can we can actually put an estimate on how fair is our our data set in the in the repositories. So this has been tested. And um, we cannot, of course, give a uh, mirror the landscape of how fair we are in the Nordic, but we can we can uh, mirror uh, the tool and uh, show the way for how we can identify where perhaps more guidance is needed to in order to uh, become more fair. So we are actually not that fair in the in the Nordics, as it turns out. I mean, this is a new concept, so naturally. Um, we are originally not built for it, but uh, but it's a good tool for us to, uh, as a guide, if you are a repository, to understand where to set in. So this tool gives uh, built on different parameters from the yes um, from expert that has been developed this. Um, my time is running here, yeah, but I and and then as I said, uh, we have a. a, a one of the biggest work packages in EOS Nordic is, is our use cases. We, we, um, uh, where we test our services and, uh, and demonstrate it within the real communities. And um, the use cases are divided into four categories. So we have um, tools, uh, infrastructure tools that, um, that are used for discovering and reuse of research data. Uh, and we have uh, services that we test uh, analysis services and post-processing services that we are testing in different communities, data management sharing and archiving uh, tools and sensitive data and orchestration. Um, that, is, uh, that is the four categories that we are uh, going to demonstrate. And this is, this is some work that it will be that is uh, about to start now. We have used the first year to map, identify, and uh, bring together um, and define the um, and build and construct the initial uh, platform. You could say of uh, of the of EOSC in in the region, and now it's time for um, to invite in the the researchers and and try testing it. So. Um, my almost uh, last slide here. I want this is the um, a, a, a little glimpse of the a new EOSC Nordic Knowledge Hub. Uh, it's it's like a virtual help center. Um, we we have people sitting in a back office, uh, but it's mostly guiding people back to their own countries and to the point of contact where where the services are being uh, delivered from. And it, it gives it's uh, the idea is to give insight to where where you can find your local uh, competences uh, there. I think my time is up, and uh, so I want just to say thank you. And uh, you can follow us on the website or or the newsletter, uh, or you can you're welcome to contact me. Thank you thank so you, much. Christine. Yes, thank you, and congratulations for having done so much in such a short time and. I know I'm uh, eager to see how the rest of the project um, comes together and to learn from what you're doing. Next up, I'd like to invite um, uh, Yui to uh, share his screen. And if any of you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in Q&A. Sometimes uh, panelists will just type in the answer uh, or we'll save some of them to the end or between uh, talks uh, for ones that lend better to um, uh, that kind of answer. But without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Yui. Yeah, Christine, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you see the slides and uh, the, the, can you hear me? I can hear you great and yes, we can see the slides. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce also a little bit, uh, a few talk uh, sentences on HIFIS. Um, so HIFIS, uh, the age in HIFIS tells you already um, there's a lot of Helmholtz around. So we are uh, a Helmholtz um, platform 
Um, and uh, with this, I want to introduce a little bit on how these uh, efforts are being made on uh, fostering uh, integrated IT uh, services in Helmholtz, together with a, spe a specific topic on uh, research storage at scale uh, at this topic for using in within HIFIS. With this, I need to say a few words about wh where we come from, uh, Germany, of course, but uh, Helmholtz specifically. Um, so uh, this was uh, 19 centers in Germany that have a very versatile, uh, very diverse uh, history and developed over a long period of time. And um, so uh, th these uh, have developed also very independently and uh, HIFAS is uh, trying to uh, put these different, um, these different uh, research uh, areas that Helmholtz uh, covers uh, to, to a common IT context. So there are six main research areas. Uh, we are coming from the matter in DAISY, but there are obviously others like aeronautics, health, uh, which is now very uh, urgent, obviously, energy and so forth. And uh, for this, uh, uh, this Helmholtz uh, Association uh, fostered this Helmholtz Information and Data Science Incubator process uh, with a lot of platforms around uh, uh, within this context, which have a little bit of different purpose. Um, for example, focusing on common schooling and education programs and or focusing on uh, uh, machine learning and uh, AI, so uh, emerging technologies uh, uh, su support and also cross uh, cross cutting uh, research projects and we are hyphis which is the underlying infrastructure which all of these uh, need to depend on to make really a cross institutional uh, work uh, ongoing um so basically uh, we are aiming for the joint research and in an information environment and um so this is very much uh, demand driven um actually so the these centers are very independent so far so the big centers have developed very independently and um the, what we really want to establish is very much user focus so that uh, the best practices and the best services are available throughout helmholtz uh, um, and also for research partners outside of that uh, at the same time, we also want to educate and uh, teach people how to make best use of that. So HIFAS has these two branches, providing services and teaching how to best use this. Um, so we want to get the best of the modern technology, the best of our scientists and uh, doing uh, optimal, optimally new fields of research out of this. Um, yeah, this year, uh, obviously, uh, for very much known reasons, uh, showed that we have a even stronger need for such kind of collaborative uh, IT services, and Hive has recognized that, of course. Um, we have a scientific advisory board, and I'm starting this uh, not because the one or the other name might uh, look familiar to you, but also because uh, this uh, gremium gives us the opportunity to really have a strong focus on this user focus on the user demands, uh, which is the scientists' demands. And uh, some uh, outcome that we got out in earlier this year, uh, you know, in late spring this year, is that we really uh, have the uh, the task uh, to uh, approach the people, to tackle the IT knowledge gap, to tackle specific research projects within Helmholtz and uh, partners. And um, so we are really dealing into towards this direction and, uh, and uh, are doing so. At the same time, we keep in mind, of course, that uh, this, this is a Helmholtz uh, uh, platform, but of course it needs interconnection to especially the European uh, context. And so we have a lot of compatibility, uh, compatibility uh, efforts and interfaces towards the European Open Science Cloud and the EGI. Um, how do we approach people? Um, first of all, uh, what we've done uh, is uh, yeah, querying them. So we made uh, several surveys around uh, several hundreds or thousands of uh, researchers in the Helmholtz uh, community covering all the research areas that I mentioned already and got feedback on them on their uh, best practices, uh, what they are using, which tools they are using and which tools they might want to use. And um, with uh, based on this um, initial data, uh, initial data, we are uh, now fostering our initial service portfolios, which is, again, these two branches, the cloud services that we provide, and on the other hand, the education services that we provide. 
Um, so these kind of services will have follow-ups, obviously, next year. And especially uh, beginning of 2021, we will uh, have a follow-up on this, really trying to tackle uh, what kind of workflows still uh, torture scientists in the sense uh, that they uh, don't really f have solutions for this at hand, but we can probably provide them. So basically tackling the very well-known knowledge gap. Um, so we have this uh, cloud services portfolio finalized currently. The full list is linked here. Um, very much uh, interest over the year was in collaboration services and common access infrastructure. We couldn't stop uh, starting pilot projects with uh, all kinds of uh, people in Helmholtz that wanted to have collaboration services, sharing data, uh, service orchestration available as fast as possible. So we had to a little bit shuffle around what we call the final portfolio and some kind of pilot um, uh, services. Um, but at the right, you might uh, just uh, schematically see that we have a kind of uh, transparent selection process in multiple iterations uh, that puts in a lot of uh, push uh, kind of uh, pro provided services and the demands from the users uh, in multiple iterations narrow down what we really provide and this results in this uh, service portfolio that we now have, including collaboration services, but also computation and storage. This will be available uh, by the beginning of the uh, year 2021, end of this year already partly, and um, so this uh, is going to take place. A very short word on how this uh, needs to be accessed. Um, this is uh, obviously needs uh, common uh, authentication and authorization infrastructure. And um, so we call this the Helmholtz AAI. Um, this is uh, very good because it's compatible to the uh, European context, EGI and EOSC, and um, uh, supports also various technologies and is also modular. So depending on the needs for which kind of services you run, you can have basic AI, so just uh, the home credentials that you provide, that you have single, uh, single sign on on all the services, or depending, for example, for high, compute, uh, high performance computing, uh, you can add as a service, uh, you can add uh, the requirement to uh, have higher demands for security like two-factor uh, authentication. All of this is documented, of course. Um, so this kind of services we uh, are now implementing and one central thing is obviously storage, uh, the, like the title or uh, meta title of this uh, talk here. Um, so one of these central storage uh, nodes that we uh, provide uh, within HIFIS and for HIFIS, uh, but it was not developed in HIFIS obviously, um, is uh, the uh, HG, HDF storage, how we call it, or the, the Dcache. Um, Dcache project has been developed um, yeah, earlier, um, which is also a very central thing of Hivis because uh, we take services uh, as Helmut Sanders have them at some points uh, available and uh, make them more widely available for the whole community and more easily accessible. And we do so also for the Dcache, for example. And Dcache has been developed very much user-driven from, from scratch in that sense. So uh, it uh, tackles the, the needs that usually occur when you are shuffling uh, large data sets around uh, a federated or distributed infrastructure, um, where you need to uh, easily share data, where you need uh, in-transit project protection so that you are sure that the data that you send is really uh, received and also not manipulated in between. You need a workflow integration, so uh, orchestration. Uh, it should be HPC friendly that on the other side, the data can be processed in an automated and easy way and so forth. And also you want to publish and interact with externals. Um, so that's why this, uh, this kind of storage has been designed with uh, that way. Basically, um, we, uh, we, the, the uh, in implementation is such that, um, that uh, the, a lot of control is uh, left uh, on the local sites where these kind of service uh, can be installed, uh, uh, yielding to a maximum of local expertise and also flexibility on the uh, implementation hardware. Um, how is this uh, done? Um, so it uses basically standard access protocols and uh, keeps compatibility uh, to uh, many layers of this um, uh, authentication uh, um, 
infrastructure and also the namespace. Uh, so it's a single rooted namespace, but the data is distributed, uh, providing the possibility that everybody understands the same, but not necessarily uh, an, a single point of um, information needs to be talked to all the time. So it is at scale and can scale with a number of nodes easily. So it's designed to federate storage, obviously. And um, it has also some fancy gimmicks uh, built in, like for example, it uh, has a, a provides a hierarchical storage management to uh, make the best out of um, uh, uh, local capabilities to increase speed and efficiency, uh, like for example, reducing lags and latency. Um, also, um, uh, yeah, so uh, also this um, provides protection of data, as I mentioned already, in two senses that it uh, can uh, have a, a additional encryption and or, of course, um, data, uh, data preservance. Uh, very important in that context is uh, what, what makes it very attractive for HIFAS is really this identity management. Um, because um, a lot of things that we would like to have in such a federated meta cloud is um, really to have flexible ways of, uh, of authenticating people and authorizing people. And Dcash provides that all from, from scratch uh, with uh, having a flexible framework with multiple protocols. And um, uh, overall, uh, it uh, provides what we need most, uh, Open ID Connect and supporting also delegation um, so that a uh, user can talk, uh, allow other users to have defined levels of uh, authorization on their data. And uh, so the, these kind of uh, access uh, rights can be distributed over the whole federated landscape very flexibly. Um, one example uh, where, we, where we provide also, or where, where this uh, storage can also be um, taken as a proxy or taken as a helper to enable also uh, independent or uh, indirect uh, services is like, for example, for file transfer, since Dcash uh, includes uh, includes uh, uh, integration with file transfer that's been originally developed by the CERN, um, this uh, Dcash service that is implemented in HIFIS uh, can help making use out of this, for example, uh, allowing uh, uh, third-party copy with sites that don't understand the FTS uh, protocol and the framework themselves. So basically, uh, the, the Dcash can serve as an active endpoint um, for this uh, third-party copy and other endpoints, which is basically the majority of Helmholtz centers, uh, do not need to uh, understand the full protocol and the full uh, FTS and can serve as a passive party uh, to uh, to really uh, make use of such kind of large file transfers, which is a common or upcoming use case that we will have more uh, because Helmholtz centers and this uh, distributed research groups that we mentioned uh, will have large data repositories growing in the one center or multiple centers and others having them processed. And then you will have the terabytes shuffling around uh, the Europe and, and, and uh, Germany where uh, where they need uh, to be placed best. Very fancy thing is also uh, event generation. So it's, it's not just storage, it's kind of clever storage, if you like. Uh, so it can trigger actions depending on data changes. So whenever data has been uh, altered in some way, uh, it can trigger actions out of this. So it can uh, uh, trigger workflows uh, like whatever, metadata extraction, it can update catalogs, it can uh, uh, launch uh, processing pipelines, uh, uh, learning pipelines, whatever you could think of. And um, this is very practical when you have increasing, uh, iteratively increasing data sets and want to have an automated, continuous uh, integrated workflow of the um, subsequent processing. Um, technically, this goes over one of uh, one of two possible directions, so either uh, over the uh, Kafka toolbox or over um, um, I notify um, workflow. So um, this is a very brief overview on this uh, research storage, which we, which we have uh, with Dcash, but obviously we have more. 
Um, there are also research storages provided, but a little bit more limited in scope uh, for, for other uh, purposes, uh, for other research centers, for example, in Jülich and in KIT, a Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, and much more uh, computation and uh, collaboration services are, as I said, being built and implemented. And so we have a roadmap for the next steps, um, which means that during the changing of the year, we will have this um, implemented very much and uh, go online with the Helmholtz cloud. Um, so I think uh, we, we can have uh, brief overview or this was a brief overview what i could uh, wanted to give on, on the hyphus um so overall we have a very positive feedback so basically we uh, uh, we ran into open doors if you want uh, at the beginning people said something like yeah i'm not sure if if it's uh, so easily accept uh, acceptable but the landscape really changed very much in the last one one and a half years uh, within the helmholtz community now on all levels, people are much open uh, on this uh, because it really gets flying now. And uh, we are really trying to approach people on the on all levels more on what they want. And uh, seemingly that shows some success that they accepted uh, this, um, this kind of uh, service distribution, which are not only localized uh, much better than earlier. Um, so, and we really try to foster these science agnostic uh, services, like we give this uh, example of the Dcash, which uh, really give some additional, um, because of their federated nature, uh, give uh, very much feedback, uh, additional value, added value to the uh, whole community. Yeah, with this, I'd like to thank you again uh, for uh, listening and <laughs> staying. Uh, you can have uh, uh, some updates on HyphusNet and also subscribe for our newsletter. And that's uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yui. Uh, and, and thank you to both you and Lenny for staying up late. Also, we really appreciate that. Um, we did have a, a question come in, and I, I'll ask it um, when while Anita um, gets ready to share her slides. Um, the question is from John Goodhue of the Massachusetts Green HPC Center, and he asks, can you give examples of the policy areas that appear to be important based on your survey? I believe he put he asked this right at the start of your talk. Okay, um, so policy areas, um, there are, I, maybe I had a bullet point here. So obviously we have a very uh, common thing uh, to solve that is uh, the distribution of personal uh, data. So the basic usage of, uh, of these services uh, that, uh, that uh, the, serv the, the centers need to allow their users to, to access um, to, to access services of other centers, basically. So for this, we have a uh, we will set up a uh, framework, a contract framework uh, that uh, that covers this whole uh, area. And for the authentication, we have the uh, back the AI policies uh, built up. And um, yeah, this is for for the access part. Um, the other point is obviously the uh, um, when it comes to accounting <laughs> um, uh, the the accounting issue is something where we in the ramp up phase we have a very clear uh, task to have these um, these services financed in a bulk manner uh, but not on a per use manner so um, this uh, we, we we do not do any accounting currently but we set up the uh, the the uh, infrastructures to do this a uh, uh, couple i think three three years from now, from now on um, uh, to, to have this set up from then on. Um, but the basic services that we provide are in that sense for the core centers free. Thank you so much. And, and thanks again for the great presentation. Congratulations on all that HIFAS has uh, uh, accomplished so far. And I look forward to seeing what happens in 2021. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Anita Nikolic who is presenting um, for Fabric. We also have Ilya Balden uh, with us today on the project. Um, please go ahead and take control of the screen when you're ready. Okay. My internet has been up and down all day, so hopefully I can share this and hopefully you can hear me. Okay, uh, can everybody see that? 
everything's great so far. And I completely appreciate that. I've got a high schooler on Zoom and my husband's on Zoom. So three of us, so far, so good. And I'm going to stop my video for just that reason. So um, I don't mean to be rude. Okay. So today I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm not going to go into great technical detail, but I'm going to talk about two projects that are interrelated, Fabric and Fab. And myself and Ilya are two of several co-PIs. And you can see kind of the interesting thing here about the team is that it spans universities and uh, government. Uh, ESNet is part of our Department of Energy. They run the network, uh, International Network for the Department of Energy. We have a combination of people who are academics and operators. And I'm gonna point out why I think that's uh, really important. So why fabric? So um, getting back to the reason my video is off, the internet is awful. Protocols are awful. It's one big workaround. I spent the first uh, chunk of my career in network operations. And if you've ever worked in network operations or security operations, you know that it's one big workaround. And uh, trying to play cat and mouse game protocols is just terrible. Security's an add-on. Privacy's almost non-existent. So that was kind of our motivating, you know, as we, as we talked as a community, the internet's awful, what can we do? So one idea is, of course, to make the future internet more stateful. And this becomes a possibility because compute has just gotten cheaper. I mean, it used to be GPUs were really expensive. Now, you know, you can buy your, your favorite flavor and have them in your home computer. Uh, if we had to build a router in the future, um, it definitely wouldn't look like the one we had today. Machine learning and AI is really taking off everywhere. And we, we're going to show how we envision the network as a big data instrument. We we're hoping to do, you know, real-time measurements and inferencing in a control loop. Um, I don't like the term self-driving network, I think that's marketing buzz, but we believe that experimenters, that there is something to this concept of real-time data collection, being able to do you know, malware and anomaly detection and provisioning of the network. Of course, IoT and 5G, um, you know, we, we're just seeing everywhere this high-speed intelligent network edge. And we wanna really have people toy around with this notion of, sorry about that, this notion of a continuum of computing where it's not just an edge or a cloud, but it's seamless and the network's part of the computing substrate. Some more motivation, fabric for everyone. So imagine, I'm gonna tell you more about the project, but just to set up the um, kind of motivation for this, we want to have this as a place where people do envision new internet and science applications that are, that are stateful, that are distributed, a better cybersecurity test bed, because cybersecurity test beds now are awful. They are not uh, realistic. And we are peering with production networks or peering with the internet to make sure that you can do very realistic security experiments. We're integrating, um, at least in the US so far, almost all the large high-performance computing centers and instruments um, to really get a big footprint of wireless and IoT. And of course, integrating machine learning and artificial intelligence. And finally, enabling training, you know, as our broader impact, this next generation of computer science researchers. So more motivation before I get into what the heck Fabric is. So I was never a testbed user. Um, my co-PI, uh, Ilya, and other of the co-PIs were big Genie users. And perhaps you, uh, you know, across the EU or in the US, perhaps you on this call have used some testbeds. So the good thing about Genie that we learned from and you can see it is kind of the gen two is it helped foster the strong builder community and um, user communities. But there are other communities like the ones I come from which is security network measurement, which really never thought of Genie or Cloud Lab as a viable platform for research. And if you look at that split in the gen two, there's Genie, there's Cloud Lab, there's Deter, and these are just US based by the way. There's you know, what the National Science Foundation and other government agencies here started doing is funding hundreds of these mini test beds. So anyone who had a autonomous vehicle proposal or cyber physical systems or network started building their own little mini test bed or emulation, and that's highly inefficient. So what we proposed to do is to build fabric. We wanted to bring along robust experimenter communities who really loved test beds, we wanted to get to people who really hated test beds. And to do that, we needed to figure out what testbed features will help us advance into the future. And you can see in kind of Gen 4, that's us. There's um, Sage, which is a project that really looks at ecology and kind of sensors in the environment, open cloud testbed. I know John's on the call. And then, you know, who knows what comes after this. So one of the big heartaches that I at least had was past testbeds were really sandboxed. As I said, they were um, 
you know, you get a slice, it was just you and your best friends and the experimental topology kind of stayed in that slice. That's great. As an operator though, that's not the network. So what we are doing that's different and we're, you know, we will make a pitch for you to help us is we are connecting these experiment topologies to the internet and to production facilities because we believe that helps develop richer, you know, if you're gonna develop what the internet's gonna look like in the future, you want the best way to do that. And that's not simply an overlay, but perhaps a combination of an overlay plus the real internet. So kind of the, the kicker here, what is fabric? So this is funded by the National Science Foundation. It's a four-year project. It's what they call a mid-scale project, which is a project in between the normal ones, which are you know fairly small, a couple million dollars, and the ones that are really, really big that are several million dollars, like a, a telescope in Chile or, or Antarctica or something. So it's kind of, a, it's one of the first projects funded that's in between those two scales. Um, I crossed out test bed because I don't like for us to sell this to you as simply a test bed. We're providing a vision and a platform and a thing and equipment to enable people to think about this new paradigm for distributed applications. So it's nationwide and it's actually now international, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Fully programmable network with compute and storage at each node. So we were very thoughtful about saying at each node, what do we need that's not just you know, a router and a switch? So we have a lot of GPUs, FPGAs, to allow people to do this computationally intensive programming um, in the network itself. So the GPUs and NICs are, you know, are all distributed in the network. Because we're lucky enough to partner with the Department of Energy who is running their energy science network, which is optical, it's, it's national, it's called ESnet6. We're very fortunate. We have the opportunity to be able to, to both co-locate equipment in many of their spaces and also partake of their optical network. So because of that, we're able to support quality of service using dedicated optical links. We will interconnect national facilities, you know, all these experimental things, uh, cloud test beds, wireless test beds, commercial clouds, universities, labs. So we're hoping that people design and test applications and protocols that run all over, not just the edge coming back to your, your data center or the cloud resting somewhere you're not sure of, but we want people to think about partaking of all these possibilities. So the crux of this is a series of fabric nodes, which are called hanks. Um, I am not a knitter, but I put a picture of a hank because a hank apparently is something that is a ball of yarn and going along with the fabric theme, they're called hanks, which is kind of a cute name to remember. But a hank is a fabric node and it's essentially, it's a rack. And what it does, and I'll show you the map on the next uh, couple of slides, is it, it's a rack of high performance servers, compute, networking, that puts compute and storage in the path of fast packet flows. We have these, um, at, you know, a range of speeds, which kind of depends where you are in the topology and the ability to do this kernel bypass or hardware offload to get just as fast a speed as you can. So conceptually, I mean, again, this isn't a highly technical talk that we have a lot of documentation on our site. Conceptually, this is what this Hank um, looks like. And, you know, we're calling it a disaggregated router, which is kind of cool. You know, so we've got the GPUs, some SSD storage, a bunch of ports, and places where both the user is able to provision to make this programmable network, and where we, the administrative domain, make sure that you're not going to use, you know, our network to DDoS your favorite uh, internet provider. So one of the big value adds that um, that we're letting people know about is really fine-grained measurement capabilities. So again, since since measurement's so crucial to building these high-speed protocols, we decided that at virtually all sites, um, we we're gonna have this GPS clock source. So that's gonna enable people to do you know, very, very fast packet captures and um, you know, very accurate packet time stamping, which is important if we wanna get to high-speed networks. Of course, some smart PDUs that people wanna do things like power, um, power studies maybe, Optical layer measurements, which we are still figuring it out because the DOE does run a production network, but we're hoping people partake of that. And the ability to share, I highlighted that because we really do want people to share measurement data from their experiments. So our next kind of key slide here is the topology. So this is what we have for the US footprint. Some of the locations are probably gonna change slightly because these racks do draw a, a, a substantial amount of power and uh, you know that's we got to make sure that's uh, congruous with the site's capabilities but you can see the yellow is a super core so that's a super high speed path the um, the rest of these the, the dark blue nodes are 
uh, the DOE facilities that they put equipment into, the other kind of light blue nodes are places like campuses, uh, regional networks, things like that. So you can see we have a fairly good coverage on the two coasts in San Diego and in the DC area, that is where we peer, uh, we do layer two, layer three peering with commercial clouds. Fab is our expansion of this. So, you know, we thought long and hard to say science is really international and we'd be really kind of limiting ourselves if we just thought about doing uh, experimentation in the US. So we went to the NSF, we made a case that we believe that um, we, fabric nodes should be put globally. So to start out, because it wasn't a huge amount of money, um, the project starts in January. Here are the first four places. We hope there'll be more. The first four places where we're putting equipment, which is Japan to do some 5G testing, the UK, University of Bristol uh, for their smart cities lab there, the University of Amsterdam, which is right in there at the, um, the science park, and of course at CERN. So we got very lucky putting them there. So the new use cases are really science focused. So astronomy and cosmology um, with these two experiments, CMBS4, one of which is at Chile, one of them's in the South Pole, the LSST, they worked with us and they really want to test new data processing solutions. They're scooping up so much information. They want to work on optimizing their alert streams and pre-processing data in transit. And we're like the ideal place to experiment with that. So whether um, the folks at the University of Miami have these new interesting workflows I and mean, weather data is so huge. I mean, if you've ever seen those maps, um, I'm not a weather person, but that just the, the huge amounts of data they ship back and forth between US and Brazil, they need to do this more efficiently to get more near real-time data on weather events. For physics, our co-PI is, uh, we needed some street cred uh, from a real scientist. Uh, Rob Gardner is part of the Atlas experiment. So we will be, um, I'll show you in the next slide how we're, how we're working with the physicists. Urban sensing, we're hoping between University of Bristol Smart Cities Lab in Chicago, which has um, a project called Array of Things. It does city, city scale sensing. We're hoping to do some kind of near real time inferencing and um, information exchange between the, these two big cities. And finally, for computer science, uh, one of my big interests is in uh, better protocols um, to do censorship evasion so that there is a free and open internet around the world. Uh, we're a little spoiled in the US. We don't realize that the protocols we have prevent a lot of people globally from getting to the internet. So here's um, kind of a snapshot of our connectivity. So this is just an example of the EU connectivity showing that CERN, you know, for example, is gonna host this node and ensure connections to um, ESnet, the US Department of Energy and other international connections enables multiple paths back to the US, to New York and to DC. University of Amsterdam, their fabric node, which is kind of um, in the upper right, that's gonna be at the Amsterdam Science Park, which also luckily for us has the Netherlands eScience Center, which is a great focal point for a lot of international science collaborations and SURF and the Netherlands r &E network. So just a brief example for high energy physics. As they prepare for the next LHC run, they think a lot about um, data analysis approaches. So we are partnering with them at CERN to use the HEP multi-point tool to transfer data from CERN. And this is not a, not a great picture, but on the right from CERN um, to in, in interactive analysis platforms back in the US on uh, supercomputers Chameleon, and Frontera and on Google Cloud as well. So along the way, they'll be splitting the data stream to give each destination only the data they need and hopefully demonstrate better performance. Our timeline, we're in year two. So we started our deployments. We started to actually put stuff in racks. Uh, we'll be doing some initial experiment onboarding. And we hope by the about the latter half of next year, so about late 2021, we'll have some early experiments kind of sussing out the architecture. So how can you help us? Um, you know, once you want, as you are writing proposals and getting funding or thinking about experiments, we would love if you would host a Hank node. We'll be, you know, there's a kind of a standard topology for them. We have formed some community working groups that'll kick off next year, particularly around data and storage. We are wrestling with what to do with all the data we're collecting and the data people want to collect and share. We, we have some answers, but we need some smart brains to help us secure this thing. We don't want to be a big DDoS cannon. And um, we'll be gathering people who really are into um, measurement studies. Feedback on our topology would be wonderful. It's all on our site, but again, we could use some um, smart brains on this. And the coolest experiments you can think of, we want to know, what do we not think about? 
So this is our site, what is fabric.net. We get a bunch of experimentation um, thoughts on there, topology documents. You can email me, uh, you can look at our software and um, we'll be doing some community workshops coming up and get on our mailing list if you go to our site and you can stay informed about them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. That was great. And really this hour just flew by. Um, well, and you know of at least two places you might put a new Hank node. You've got um, <laughs> the Nordics and, and possibly uh, Helmholtz facility. Um, we have a quick question from John Goodhue. He asks, how will the fabric CERN experiment relate to the work that the LHC is doing to upgrade their production network and compute? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, Rob, who's our co-PI, socialized with um, both the Atlas team, of course, and with the CERN folks to say, you know, this is kind of, you know, as they do upgrade production and compute, this is one way they have in theory of making it more um, efficient. So they've actually, they want to use fabric as a way to, as a proof of concept before they um, finish that production and before they definitively say, here's our new production workflows for the, for the next run. Uh, does that answer your question, John? I don't think he has a quick way on the webinar okay. version of Zoom to say so, but but um, we know where to find you if he has more he yeah. has more questions. And I just like again to thank all of our presenters. I uh, hope it's okay to do a really quick lazy screen share. I won't go into presentation mode just for uh, time constraints. But I would uh, invite you to uh, keep watching our our website. And you can register for our January webinar, which is going to tell you everything you wanted to know about the Open Storage Network. Um, that will be January 21st, a Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific, um, early in 2021. It will be an auspicious week here in the U.S. And please keep watching our website for our next concept paper. So with that, I'd like to uh, close out the webinar and again, thank our speakers so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.